Most people don't know the answers to those. And that's why a lot of people end up making the number one mistake in business, which is marketing before your brand is built. Welcome to the More Than Corporate Podcast. I'm Amber Furman, recovering perfectionist and serial accomplisher. If you're anything like I used to be, you've been living your life thinking that if you accomplish enough stuff, you'll finally find the success you've always wanted. But what if it's not about accomplishing more stuff? What if it's about accomplishing the right stuff? I believe you don't find success. You create it by intentionally designing the life you want and having the courage to get out of your comfort zone to live your design. I went from doing what I was supposed to do to doing what I love to do, and now I get to help others do the same. Keep listening as I chat with inspiring people who make it their mission to live their best life every day and learn how you too can live the life you've always wanted. Welcome back to another episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. I am really excited to bring two amazing guests to you today. We have Tanya Eberhardt and Michael Carr with us. Tanya and Michael love inspiring stories, engaging conversations, and they have a mission to help. This is how most people describe them. They're international best-selling authors, branding speakers, hosts of the Be Bold Branding podcast, and partners in their company, Brandface. They have helped and inspired real estate agents, authors, podcasters, coaches, and business owners in five countries and 43 U.S. states to stand out, overcome obstacles, and become an authority in their market through the power of personal branding. Their passion is unveiling inner stars, their mantra is people don't do business with a logo. They do business with a person. And I'm smiling and screaming inside because I hear that so much. So many people say, let's get our website and then we'll do business. Man, um, they are their most famous quote is great branding doesn't just change the way others see you. It changes the way that you see yourself. And I'm really excited to dig into that topic specifically. Before I bring Michael and Tanya on to discuss all the amazingness about their business, their lives, and their success, I want to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by Success Development Solutions. If you are somebody who is trying to figure out why you haven't quite reached that level of success that you've been looking for, or maybe you have reached it and it didn't bring you the happiness or fulfillment that you want, then let's sit down and talk about what's missing and what's not working. Let's go ahead and make sure that you have the roadmap and the blueprint that you need to design the life that you've always wanted, and then make sure that you fill yourself with the courage to actually execute that plan. You can head to successdevelopmentsolutions.com slash life wheel. You'll have a starting point there. We can book a call, have a conversation to see what the, back, the next steps are for you to be able to live the life you've always wanted. And without further ado, let's go ahead and have a conversation with Michael and Tanya. Hi, guys. Thank you so Hi, much for joining me. How are you doing today? Thank you for having us. We're doing great. Every day Saturday over here, Amber. Oh my gosh. I love that motto so much. I think that we spend way too much of our lives waiting for the weekends and to be able to just love what we do is so fantastic. Amen. Agreed. Oh my gosh. So there's so much to dig into. And before we um, dig into the really cool stuff, um, let's find out about you guys as people. Not that you're not cool. Holy cow. Do you guys ever say things and you're like, the way that this is going to sound is horrible. You guys are amazingly cool. Before we dig into the branding stuff, let's talk about you guys. Um, I'm interested to know from both of you. And I always start with this question because I love the way that our minds grow and expand over time. When you guys were in high school planning out what your life was going to look like, when we were teenagers and knew it all, um, what did you think you were going to be doing when you grew up? Did you ever imagine it was this? No, I did not. I, I'll answer that one first because um, I was pretty sure I was going to be an attorney. Oh, you made the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> agreed, agreed. Well, well, here's the thing, you know, it's all about theatrics, right? So I get into college and I get really involved in theater and uh, I actually had a, um, 
a scholarship, a theater scholarship. And I, and as soon as I got there, I thought, Oh, this legal stuff is for the birds. I'm going to go be this, you know, famous um, actress. And I started doing some stuff and in college. And then I moved for theater school for Florida state university, which has a very renowned theater school in, in this country, moved down there and then realized uh, about six months in, it's like, Oh, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ended up selling vacuum cleaners door to door. So that's my star, Amber. Attorney to aspiring actor to vacuum salesman. Sounds yeah, like, um, yeah. I like to say I just kept going straight up the ladder, right? Yes. So I'm <laughs> curious, what about um, being an actress did not resonate with you? Well, it was just a place that I felt, you know, you ever go someplace and you feel like I just don't belong here. I, you know, there were a lot of very eccentric people in the theater world, especially in live theater, you know. Um, stage theater. And I felt like I was, they were trying to sometimes pretend to be something they really weren't. And I'm just me. And I just, that <laughs> me just didn't fit into that world. I just didn't feel comfortable with it. Um, and the other part is, you know, I, I really have to look back and say, was I good enough to make it to Hollywood? Was I good enough to, you know, Anybody can do anything if they truly, truly want it. Uh, so, so the question shouldn't even really be a question. But at the time, for me, it was no, I wasn't that. I wasn't that good. Um, I was better at other things, or better suited for other things. Is probably a better way to put it. Oh, there's so much to dig into there. Before I do, I want to hear all about Michael for a second. Michael, what did you think you were going to be doing when you were were here, as you were planning out your life as a kid? Uh, it, it's funny. I, I, I have both sides of that aisle covered. I actually did what I dreamed of doing, which is to become an auctioneer. I, that was always my dream. And I did so right out of high school. So I worked for an engineering firm for about three or four months after getting out of high school and then went out on my own. And I've been on my own ever since. Um, so I wanted to be a contract auctioneer. I became one. And then in time, it led to me becoming America's top selling real estate auctioneer. Oh, wow. Wow. My mentor told me to get my real estate license. I can make a little extra money. And I ended up selling more residential real estate than anybody in the United States. Well over 78,000 transactions. I've been licensed in over 30 states. I've sold property in over 30 states. Um, so got, uh, got a lot of the life that I really dreamed of. But what was interesting is now, especially building brands like we do and, and still building my real estate company, I never realized that my true calling was helping other people be all that they can be. And I, I would have never thought in a million years that I would have owned a brokerage where I would be responsible for other people or at least carry the burden of responsibility of other people, much less uh, selling a program that we are personally involved in it, with every one of our clients because uh, people come into our program, we just we take them on and, and their success is very important to us. And I never really thought that would be my vow. I would find my personal value in that. And so that part of my life was a real surprise because now I feel like I do every day as the abundant life broker, exactly what I was made to do. So abundant life broker. That's yeah. fantastic. I love to hear the names that people um, create. And this, this is going to be an interesting conversation because there's what we call ourselves, right? And then there's what everybody else calls us, which I'm sure is what you deal with so much. And we can try to create the brand that we want so much. I, mine is success architect. Um, you're the abundant life broker, but if that's not what our clients see, then it doesn't really matter what we call ourselves, right? Which is where you guys get to feel it, to fill in the holes. I think that that's, that's so amazing. Um, what do you think it was about being an auctioneer that led or translated so well to the real estate field that caused you to be successful there? Um, it's hard to say. I, I, I don't know. I, my dad was a car dealer and that's how I got introduced to the business. We bought our cars at most of them at auction. And I just remember going to the first auction with him and, you know, we parked in a lower parking lot. We're walking up towards the building and I see this El Dorado Cadillac drive by with this white carriage roof and white leather. And he parks in the first parking space beside the door and he gets out and he's got this big diamond ring and a Rolex watch and a trench coat and a tie and everything. I'm like, dad, what is he? 
he do? He's like, oh, that's Steve. He's the auctioneer. And I was just starstruck. I was like, ah, oh, that's what I want to do. Like for the rest of my life, I want to do this. And I did. And then uh, he became that very person became one of my mentors. I had several over the years and he had he became the first one really to, to help bolster that. So I don't know. I like to I like to hustle and bustle. It was almost like a carnival um, something. I like the fast pace. You know, and uh, we, we, we make decisions in 30 seconds in a minute that, uh, that and spend thousands of dollars doing su- stuff like that and reading people and then inf- and seeing if I can have an influence in my sales pitch within seconds versus minutes that we have in other arenas. And I just was really attracted to that. I love the speed of it all. Yeah, I was interested to because I've never been involved in the auctioneer world um, other than just passively looking back and being in awe of the talent that it takes to be good at it. Um, But you hit something on the nail on the head that I think is so important. And that's that need to make instant decisions combined with the need to read people. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was curious to know how much you thought that had to do with your success in real estate, because that would have been my guess. You know, you are, you have less than a second to decide if you need to change the way that you're talking to get a certain result in an auction setting. And, and then that ability to make decisions, how many entrepreneurs have we met that can't make decisions? Mm -hmm. And, and so that ability to just pull the trigger, deal with the consequences, pull the trigger, deal with the consequences and constantly move forward, I think is a skill that a lot of people need to develop. I agree with that a thousand percent. We deal with that in our clients and brand face now. And we find ourselves really, we're not coaches. We don't really call ourselves coaches at all. But, you know, when you're teaching somebody uh, something that you know effectively is what you're doing. And we're always begging our clients and our new clients when they come in and shaping those minds to make those marketing decisions, those branding decisions that make a difference. And when it's brand new ground to them, you know, we a lot of times I, we have to say what she told me when I was in San Bernardino, California, before I hired her, she's like, I've told you everything. I've answered all your questions. Now you just have to trust me. And I did. And it's been now it's the secret to my success is just listening to her. Hey, you know what? I think that there are a lot of you you should become a relationship coach is what you should be, because I think you just solve like 90 percent of of marriages. There you go. (laughs) with That statement. Right. Um, So you guys met as or. You guys met because you became um, her client or had you met before and then you became her client? No, you want to tell that story? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we met when he became my client. Uh, mm. My my aunt, Carolyn, who was one of his real estate agents early in his brokerage when he was just kind of getting started with the brokerage, um, real estate brokerage, she introduced us because she said his marketing was terrible <laughs> and that he needed help. And, and she was so, right. And, and so <laughs> she, it was really kind of sneaky. She would call me and say, Hey, uh, Michael's waiting on your call. And she would call Michael and say, Hey, Tanya's waiting on your call. And she literally set us up like that. And so I finally called him one day and said, Look, I don't know who's supposed to be calling whom here, but um, here I am. Let, let, we, we need to talk. So, so several weeks later, I was finally able to convince him. And finally, I just got tired of answering all of his questions. And I said, look, I've answered every question that you have given me and I've answered it well. And I said, at this point, you're just going to have to trust me. And that's a true story. And he did. And that was, you know, almost 10 years ago. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it's 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 been quite a journey. And, you know, working together that first year, we built his personal brand that first year. Well, we built it rather quickly early in the first year that we worked together. And by the end of that year, his business had already quadrupled. And, mm-hmm. uh, and it has since that time, every single year, it has doubled or more than doubled year over year. And so you can see why just a couple of years into our you know, working relationship together, he said, uh, you know, I invited him to become a partner in the company because he was so, he bought into the concept, he used it, it worked. He was like, he was not just a client, he was a partner. Yeah. yeah. It, 
if I could expand upon that, like I really, I was rude to her at first. I really was. I, <laughs> I didn't mean to be, I, you know, but at the time, I was tough, you were tough. You were, and you are, <laughs> thank goodness. And they, tenacious. I love it. They, you know, I, you know, I, I came from Atlanta. I had an office in Atlanta. I had an office in Irvine, California. I had an office in Seattle, Washington. Uh, there were times back then that I would cross the United States four times in one week uh, to each office. I spent a lot of time in Manhattan, Miami, Chicago, Dallas. Dallas, all, Boston, um, all the big, definitely big metropolitan areas. And so I was traveling a lot and and had this brokerage back home that was just sitting sort of dormant because this is in the REO days. And but I as auctioneers do, we work ourselves out of a job. So I knew that you know real estate would bounce back. It would come back. We would get back to to times like we've experienced the past five, six years. Um, and so but, you know, you go through a lot of employees and stuff that are trying to do this. And she calls me and she's like, hey, you know, I'm different. And I'm like, I doubt it. You know, I'm, I'm just like, you know, I've got five others just like you. I don't need another one. I think it's exactly what I told her. And and she goes, hey, you've never met anybody like me or a program like what I've got. And so she proved it to be the case. But as soon as I recognized that, that she did have the goods, that she did know what she was talking about, I did let go of the wheel. And just said, okay, I'm busy. I'm doing, I'm closing down these other shops. I'm, REOs are drying up. I'm coming back to build this brand uh, in arm's length transaction. And I trusted her implicitly. And if she told me to jump, I jumped um, because I hired the right person for the job. And you trust them and get out of the way when that's the case. And, and that's, so I'm only partly tongue in cheek when I say that she's the secret of my success. And I just listen to what she tells me. So. <laughs> And of course, you know, I love it. It's music to my ears. But You know, I think it's interesting uh, from somebody who has struggled with branding so much in you said something. I have five of you. I don't need another one because I feel like branding is one of those things where somebody, first of all, branding and marketing gets confused Very and much. people think, oh, I have somebody running my Facebook ads. So I have somebody who does my branding. Yeah, where I have somebody who does my website. So I have somebody who does my branding. And I know I fell into this for so long of why do I need a brand if I have a marketer? And then I worked with a marketer once who said, and I, I actually still work with him, where I said, I think I'm going to go talk to branding. And he says, good, because I don't do that. And I thought, how? How do you market and you don't brand? And that was the first conversation I had with somebody that really separated that they're two different things that deal with and, and they have to work hand in hand. So when you have a client that's coming to you or you're interacting with somebody for the first time and they're telling you all the things they need to have done, the website, the Facebook ads, the Google ads, all the things, and they have no clarity on their brand, how do you communicate with them how important branding is first? Well, the first thing we do is is do exactly, you know, what what uh, should be done, which is defining the difference between the two. And we pretty much simplify it, Amber. It's like marketing is using various different marketing vehicles, channels, or platforms to get a message out to your customers. It can be, it can be a magazine ad, it can be Facebook ads, it can be billboards, it can be any, any way you can get a message out. That's marketing. Your brand is the message and image that you put on those marketing platforms. So the first thing we say is, okay, how do you, first of all, know, know where you're going to market? If first of all, you don't know who it is you're talking to, that's step number one in Huge. a brand. And then, you know, what are you going to say to that person to attract more of them if you don't know who it is and what sets you apart? that will attract those people. So mm -hmm. most people don't know the answers to those. And that's why a lot of people end up making the number one mistake in business, which is marketing before your brand is built. What do you think is uh, how in my head, there's this huge mistake that gets made and you can tell me whether I'm completely on or off that people believe that branding is a one and done situation. Do you get clients like that that think, oh, I'm going to hire you to help me figure out my brand. And then they're done because they have their brand figured out and they don't realize that with every shift your business makes, your brand needs to shift as well. Do you experience that or is that just in my head? That's a complicated question, but I'm going to answer it like this. Most of the time, I won't say it's one and done, but it's 95% and done. Okay. Good. 
because because your story is your story and it's not going to change. So if, if we look at it this way, your brand has to answer five critical questions. It's who do you serve? How do you serve them? What qualifies you to serve them? How does it make their life better? And what sets you apart from everyone else who's also trying to help that person? Okay, so you answer all of those things first. And when you do that, then your brand is, and you you have your photo shoot, you create the, you know, you create all of these parts and pieces. We call them branding elements, elements of a logo. We hear all the time somebody say, um, oh, well, I already have a logo. I, I've got my brand. And I'm thinking that's one element of a mm -hmm. logo. We look at 77 different criteria when we build a personal brand. A logo wow. is one of them. Right. One of the 77 things we look at. So your your brand is not just your colors or your logo or your tagline or your photo. It's those things plus a lot more. It's the whole, a brand is an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So once you create that ecosystem, then moving forward, you just tweak it here and there. So let's say you have won some awards or you have gained some more designations or accreditations or you've gotten, you know, some accomplishment. Well, you want to add that to some of your brand messaging so people know why they should choose you over somebody else. And so as you grow, your brand evolves, but it doesn't you don't have to uproot it and redo it every couple of years. You literally have to go in and look at it and say, okay, what's changed since the last time I look at this that's important enough that it affects the story? Mm. And of course, every couple of years, you we recommend a new photo shoot every two to three years. But I love that. that, everything is solid and it's almost a one and done. What's changed that is important enough to include in your branding and in the story. I think that that's yeah. an important question. This is something that I know that a lot of my listeners struggle with in the fact that, you know, we come from a generation, maybe even 10 years ago, might be going back too far, where you could have multiple different brands that were kept completely separate. So you, we deal with a lot with entrepreneurs, business owners that own multiple different brands. And in the past, you would be able to build a brand for one business. For example, I have a law firm, I have a coaching business, I have a sales training business. So you could build a brand for your law firm. You could build a brand for your coaching business. You could build a brand for your training business. You could keep them separate and no one would know because you're not online marketing. You're not doing all this stuff. But now I feel like you weave in and out of every single brand that you have. So how do you balance that personal brand with needing you to pop in and out of every single business, but also they serve different clients and purposes. Um, I, without going too deep, because I know this is what you guys get paid for, what advice do you have for people when they're starting to think about that? You want to answer that? Or me um, well, it, it, the way you, I can you start. Go first yeah, and, we'll, and you can we'll pick both. it back. <clears throat> so first off, I agree with you a hundred percent. Like it is that personal branding is personal. That's what we do. And we, in our program, we teach people through our 3D formula, define, develop, and display. We teach people that their story is so important to their brand. It's because that is parts that are never going to change about your brand. Uh, what got you to where you are? Uh, what led you into it, whether that's one box or three boxes, like how, what were those things that built up the education, your life experiences, what you're doing now, your, the, the business that you started, those things are very important. And what we find to your point is now that we have social media, we can show up in, in, in dozens and dozens and dozens of different arenas. They all need to point back to that personal brand for what you, no matter what your craft is, whether it's a law firm, whether it's a marketing company, whether, no matter what that is, is. And if you're involved in all those things, they blend together because you are the story of why somebody is going to want to use your service. And uh, what would you add to that? Uh, yeah, I, like very well put. I would just say your your personal brand describes why you're involved in these mm -hmm. three businesses. Right now, I, a word of caution. <laughs> to everybody that I always get this question too. And this is re really where we help people kind of fine tune things because we also work with a lot of coaches and consultants and podcasters and so forth. And, and they are involved in several different businesses. So 
one of the things that can happen to entrepreneurs if they don't dial that brand in is that they they spread the they spread too thin. They cannot possibly keep up with everything they're doing. So we say everything starts with who you are as a person. So I'll give you a case in point. This is the best example that I can give. In 2011 or 12, I was sitting in my office and at the time I had an integrated marketing company and we helped so many different people. We built websites, we did everything. And it came out of kind of that, the years of the mortgage debacle, 2006 through 2008, because so much, so many marketing companies suffered during that time because marketing is the first thing to get cut when the economy goes bad. Mm -hmm. So at that time, a lot of us felt like, okay, we've just got to do anything to keep money coming through the door. We'll just take on any job. As long as we can do it, we'll just do it. And that's where I came up with the quote, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sitting at my desk one day and I'm thinking, okay, anybody that walks through that door, I can do business with. That's awesome. But you know what's terrible? Anybody who walks through that door, I can do business with. And what that meant is I was no longer special. I no longer could offer things that somebody else couldn't offer, right? I, we all like did the same thing. So what was going to set me apart from everybody else? And I literally stopped and did some self-discovery and thought, okay, what is it about what I've done all these years that that really is a passion for me. And it was about helping people build the personal brands. And so when I realized that, spreading myself too thin, all of that stuff, stopped in its tracks and I focused. And once I did that, everything came to light. And it's so easy for entrepreneurs to get spread in so many different directions. Let your person be the guide. Let your personal story in your life be the guide because that's never going to steer you wrong in what's really in your heart, what you want to do. We end up doing things a lot of times for money and that's really not what we always want to do. And if you follow your heart, the money will follow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that so much. And um, you'll find this was the most surprising thing for me is that when you do narrow that down, that you actually get more clients than you did when you just thought, oh, I'll help everybody. And it's this fear that we have. And I can only speak about this, not because I'm an expert in branding, but that I'm an expert in fear. Um, I, um, <laughs> fear story I for you too. Right? Fear story. <laughs> What's that? I have another fear story when you finish your thought. <laughs> yes. Um, but we think if I make this decision, if I narrow down my niche, if I exclude these people that are not my, my passion, then I'm going to lose that percentage of money. And I was so shocked when I did that and my income shot up. I was like, this makes no logical sense to me, but I'll do yeah. it. Right. Same was that your experience as well? Oh yeah. Same thing happened to me. I knew that if I shifted gears, I would lose approximately 80% of the business. And this was monthly retainer income. Okay. So most people would think I was complete nuts. <laughs> and I, but I knew that wasn't going to last forever. I was not going to be able to sustain that or grow that. I wasn't going to be able to scale it because how can you scale something everybody else does too, if you yeah. don't do it differently. So once I did that, guess what? I lost 80% of my business in about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and guess what? After that, within that first year, I tripled the amount of money that I made the year before. It was incredible. Yep. And, and that's when, you know, I really knew it's like, oh yeah, this thing about focus, it works. It really works. It does. Like in, in the real estate business, it's, I teach my agents, you know, I, being a national name in the, in the real estate business, um, when the REOs went down and then we started doing arm's length transaction, my natural inclination was, okay, well, I want to do arm's length transaction with the same fervor that I was doing the wholesale auctions and RO auctions. And I learned real quick, you know, that's extremely hard to do. So then I'm like, okay, well, we'll just take over Georgia. And then I realized, oh, man, that's extremely hard to do. And then I'm like, okay, we'll just take over Atlanta. And then I'm like, that's extremely hard to do. And the lesson that I learned that now I can teach my agents is I know you come in here and I know you're full of fire and, you know, and you, you I, I take over the world, right? You want to keep that fire and you want to go take over the world. Now let's do it one neighborhood at a time. Mm. So God, if you shrink that thing down and you say, I'm going to focus on move ups, I'm going to focus on downsizers. I'm going to focus on this age group. 
I'm going to focus on you. You, you first, your first instinct is, well, why would I do that? Why don't I sell a house to anybody? And then the rest of it is exactly what you said and what Tanya has said. What you end up finding is people are attracted to you because that's all you work with and you know it better than anybody. You know how to talk to them. You know how to advertise to them. You know how to set your brand that speaks to them. You know every ounce of that. And that is invaluable. You can always add other niches to it after you've perfected one. It's so important. You'll see your business grow like overnight if you do that. So Gotta on that point, when you add those extra niches, because I totally relate to what you're saying, you you wouldn't believe, well, you would believe because you've been there. How many people walk into my law office and say, I came to you because this is all you do? You know, I have, I have the billboards. I don't have a billboard. There are billboards out there that will say, immigration, criminal defense, personal injury, tax, wills. And, right. and the more that gets up there, the smaller the print gets and the more diluted the message gets, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if they were to take out seven billboards that said immigration, one that said criminal, one, then, then they have that bigger power. Um, I love that you talked about the niches, getting those up, and then adding another one. Like nobody's saying that you can't do all those things. Right. You're saying that you can't do them at the same time. And I think that's a message that's missed way too much in this field. I agree. Yeah. And it's all about relatability. Okay. So if you have, if you're trying to run three different businesses and, and they have nothing to do with one another, you're going to, you're going to run yourself ragged and you're going to spread yourself too thin. But if those three businesses have, have, relatability if they relate to one another and to your story and to why you're doing what you're doing and you can and your personal story says hey this this is my story and here's why i have these businesses that makes all the sense in the world mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that because it, it also just knowing what I know about the way the mind works from my NLP trainings and and coaching trainings is our brain needs a way to put it all together as well. As much as our clients do, yeah. our brain does. Mm -hmm. And so we need to know, okay, today I'm going to wake up and I'm going to focus on whatever that is. And if they seem completely unrelated to us, we feel like we're this like string doll, like what was the Gumby dolls that could get pulled in different directions, yeah. right? <laughs> yep. Whereas if we've solidified it in our own minds, then it's easier for us to be productive. So I think that that personal branding that you guys are talking about is just as important for us and our productivity as it is for our clients and our bottom line. No doubt. Mm -hmm. we, we say all the time, you can't, it's hard to calculate the cost of confusion. And so many people get up every day, no matter what your industry is. And they're like, well, I know I should be doing something, but I don't know what to do. I promise you, if you dial your brand in, you get up every day knowing exactly what you need to do. Exactly yeah. what you need to say today. Mm -hmm. Exactly who you need mm -hmm. to say it to. And then you're sitting there thinking about, okay, how can I say the same thing in a different medium? That now you're talking about how can I build my marketing? And then when you start doing that, then you start seeing the return on your investment. And you're like, you know what? If I spend it over here and I say this same message this way on this medium, I get this result. And if I say that same message over here in this medium, I get this result. Okay, I want to spend more money on this because it's a higher rate of return. And you can't start any of that until you know what your brand is and you know exactly who you're talking to. So you know exactly what to say to them. And once you get that dialed in, that's why people say all the time. And I was one of those people too. Marketing stinks. Marketing doesn't work. Yes. Right. Marketing. Yeah, I promise you marketing works. It absolutely works. But it, if you approach it before you know what you're saying to your ideal customer, which is your brand, you're not going to have an ROI. You're going to be like and I knew I know very rich people who don't know that concept. I, I asked a guy one time it's worth six hundred seven hundred million dollars. I'm like, how much money should my firm be spending on a budget line item in marketing every month? And his answer was all of it. What? Yeah, that was his answer. <laughs> All of it. I went, what? And his game plan was anything that he went into, he just spent millions of dollars throwing it at it, right? And then backing it away as the business came in. I don't think that's a good plan. I really don't. Like, I, I, I don't. We know branding has, there's two ways that branding truly works for us, right? We, we could outspend everybody and try to figure that out. And, and do it over a long period of time, right? If we you're not a small business, right? 
you can if you're a small business. Yeah. It's one thing for, you know, uh, you know, like Rich Barton or Zillow or somebody to go over here to Wall Street and spend everybody's life, you know, millions of people's life savings on their 20 or 30 million dollars in advertising every year to let everybody know what they do. It's different if you're the small business inside of town and you want to be the biggest landscaper or you want to be the biggest attorney or you want to, you know, it's totally different. Those brands are built on impressions. Yeah. One impression gets you business. Two impressions can get you business. Ten impressions get you business. And then a hundred and then a thousand and then a million. And that's how you grow it without going over here and leveraging, you know, $20 million worth of worth of uh, gamble money is what I call it. So 99.9% .9 of us fall in that particular space where we're building small to medium sized companies. And then we have clients all the time. They're just like, look, I don't even want a huge company. I just want to work with the people I like to work with. And branding can give you all of that. It can give you whatever that dream is and whatever that scalability is. But it starts with knowing who your ideal customer is and what you're saying to them. Man, I love that so much. And I like the way that you talked about the transition too, because this was something, there's so much that's flashing in my head as you guys are talking, because I did the law firm, the coaching business and the training business came out of me having to fall back in love with being an attorney and like, figuring out my life and then watching other attorneys who were running themselves ragged and how can I help? And then this all happened. And when I did that and I started promoting my coaching and training services, I had that confusion of, but you're an attorney, right? And I had to figure out a way to bring it all together. And so my slogan became breaking you out of your gel in your own mind. And I thought it was really interesting how, you know, when I was working with my coach, she said, I was like, I'm having a hard time explaining to people why I became a coach. And she's like, well, weren't you already one? And I said, well, no. And she says, Amber, if you haven't been coaching your attorneys for the last 10 years, then you weren't a very good attorney. And I had to step back and think, man, I've been a coach for 10 years. My clients were just different, right? Um, and, and so figuring that out, is exactly that personal branding that you're talking about. I never would have been able to make that connection without it. Right. Yeah. It's a great revelation. Mm -hmm. And that you're what you just described is exactly what Tanya taught me and what we talk about now. A great brand doesn't just change the way others see you. It changes the way you see yourself. Yes. Uh, and that focus gives you a reason to get up tomorrow and, and to know what you're doing, you know, yeah. and it brings it. And it's more than just we don't talk enough about it. Probably it's it's more than just losing that confusion and having that direction. It also makes it joyful. And it, right. like, if we're not enjoying what we're doing, we should not be doing it. If you Agreed. dread going to work tomorrow, if you dread being boss tomorrow, you need to be boss over something else. Because I get up every day. I said it when you started your show every day, Saturday. And it is just a mindset and it is finding what it is that you want to say, how to say it, when to say it. It's dialing your brand in. It's defining it, developing it and displaying it. And now you know how to live every day. Absolutely. I love it. So let's um, let's talk to the people who are either new entrepreneurs who haven't delved into this a whole lot, who are trying to figure out who the hell they are before they figure out what their brand is. Um, because I feel like that's a big transition of what do I want to do? And I, I think as I'm looking at what you guys are doing, I can see how much you can bring clarity to somebody's career journeys through helping them understand what they're passionate about. When most marketing companies would just say, okay, how are we going to tell people what you do? Which is completely different. Totally so, different. For that person that's sitting there going, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I know I need to start somewhere. Um, I got to make life decisions before I can figure out branding decisions. What do you say to them? Well, you know, there we, we have generally a set of discovery questions that we walk people through when they go through our process. And some of those include things like who might have influenced you in your life when you were growing up, right? What lessons might they have taught you? Uh, what it was there a 
certain event that changed your life, the course of your life or direction and caused you to be doing what you're doing right now. And maybe like you did help you find that joy and that new purpose in something you've been doing for a while, but you just kind of let it fade a little bit. Right. And, um, and things like, okay, what kind of education or training do you have that's going to position you really well to go after who you want to work with? And then what kind of people would you like to help? Who are you most compelled to help? Who do you like really think, okay, gosh, if I could just help this person, that would be awesome. Or who you want to spend time with. Um, and a lot of that, I have one guy on the phone one day and we were going through this with him and he said, I don't know who I want to work with. I said, all right, Kevin. I said, let's go backward with this. Tell me what you, who you don't want to work with. Give me mm -hmm. all the character traits, all of the, about somebody you don't want to work with. And he listed like 12 of them, like super quick. And I said, see, okay. So, so we listed those 12 on the left, on the right, we put the opposite qualities. Yeah. You don't want someone who is a know-it-all. Therefore you want someone who respects the knowledge and experience you bring and will actually let you do your job. So that's one way. Those are several different things that hopefully will kind of get your, uh, you know, creative uh, juices flowing. You guys are so amazing for doing that. In the coaching world, we talk so much about how you can ask somebody what they want and they can't tell you. You can ask them what they don't want and they'll give you three hours worth of exactly, things. That they don't exactly. Want, right? Well, let's and talk about that human beings like we don't take yes. the time to say i got such great service going through the mcdonald's window the other day or or wherever it was but they'll sure take time to tell you how that person sucked <laughs> right and, yeah. and that's not the world that we you know, that's we the world run. we live in but it's not the one we, i want to live in yeah we'll <laughs> run we'll run faster from pain than towards pleasure and that's yes. Or it should be opposite. Like you should be the other way around. And um, you know, I think that so much of that is that people have grown up believing that pleasure isn't possible, right? Mm -hmm. They've grown up thinking that the struggle is what I mean. Uh, how I could do a whole podcast on this with you guys. Our society right now romanticizes the struggle. That, that, that yeah. so much, and so we grow up thinking if it's not hard, it's not worth it. If I don't have to fight for it, it's not worth having. So then when we start saying, well, what do you want? Well, that pleasure feels like it's not worth having because we didn't have to fight to get it. And I love that you guys are trying to take that away from people. Absolutely. You know, uh, like this is the first time we've ever had this conversation, Amber. So you've given us so much to like some amazing questions and thought here today. But I would like to say about that, that yes, we, our society romanticizes the struggle for sure. But even more than that, we romanticize the fact that you have to start out practically homeless and with no clothes and no food in order to say that you are, uh, you know, a, a credible, respectful entrepreneur, right? Huge height. Yes. But what we don't realize that, I, you know, I didn't grow up in a, in a, in a, uh, an underprivileged, you know, family. I didn't grow up with a lot of the challenges that I know people out there have. I just focused on what cha what challenge did I face in my life that I figured out how to overcome that, and I can help somebody else do the same thing. So their level of understanding of that is is peaked, and also that I don't, it doesn't have to be a huge thing, right? It turns out in, in my particular journey, I looked at it and thought oh, I was getting the door slammed in my face. I didn't like how people were treating me. I, I, you know, the more important the people were, the harder the door slammed. And I realized I had, if I wanted to be viewed differently, I had to present myself differently as valuable to them in some mm -hmm. way. And so to me, that was like a super simple thing. It wasn't that, you know, I was living on the streets or in a car. I literally just had this problem of having doors slammed in my face. That's a big problem for a lot of people. But it turns out the things that we think, you know, we don't think are huge problems like that, right? 
that happens to everybody. A lot of business owners get the door slammed in their face. Mm -hmm. But what it turns out that what we think are just mediocre problems or struggles end up to just be life altering kinds of things. Because I look back now and I see, and this just came to me the last two or three years. I, I look back and I see, you know, when I was growing up, I was surrounded by alcoholism and addiction in my family, both sides. And I realized that sometimes the only difference in a young kid waiting on the next drug deal and one going off to college with a bright future is somebody is just self-worth. It's self-worth and your personal brand. That's where a great brand doesn't just change the way others see you. It changes the way you see yourself. That's really when I, when I explored and I got several years into it at the heart of the matter of what brand face can do for people, it can help them see their own value in the world. And that is really the reason we get up and do what we do every day. Mm -hmm. It's not, just to help an, uh, a, a young entrepreneur get to that next level of business or present themselves differently. That's on the surface. What it does underneath is so much more important. Mm -hmm. I have goosebumps right now. I like chills because I tell people this all the time. There's an individual that um, I'm very close to that we connected over an online Facebook group and through connecting, we realized we had a ton of the same life stories. We lost our dad at the same age. We both had a history of suicide in our family. A ton of the same stories. Where our story forked is he was facing 20 years in prison and I have a law degree. And wow. we did a whole podcast episode about how people look at me and they say, man, look at her. Congratulations on what she's done. She's so successful. And then they looked at him back then and said, what the hell is wrong with your life? And if they broke down the pain that made us make those choices, it was the same pain. Mm -hmm. We just made different choices. I numbed with academic achievements and it created what society saw as success. He numbed through what society sees as numbing, which is drugs and alcohol and, and mm -hmm. a life of crime. But we were running from the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that you brought that to light because we don't look at what is causing people to make the choices that they're making enough. We just look at the choices and either celebrate those or criticize them. Great. Well, but now I got chill. Bumps. That's, That's beautiful. That's well, beautiful. extremely well put. I, I always uh, likened it to a switch. Some people flip. They, they can go through the exact same, you know, struggle and flip the switch in two different ways. Some of them positive, some of them negative. Uh, I wish that everybody could do it positive uh, and just realize what I realized in my life is that and we all have struggles like and I don't think there's a greater struggle or a, a worse struggle. I really don't. I, I, I believe we are equipped for the struggles that we're given and then we're given those opportunities to us. Each individual, the struggle is is just as horrific and no matter what it looks like on the outside. And I don't take that away from people. Uh, but I think that if they could look at the fact that whatever struggle you're going through is really just instruction for the blessing that's coming, then maybe they would look Excellent. at it differently. Um, wow. And we try to teach that in Brandface, like what your life experience. I mean, we've had people in Brandface who have lost children, like infantile drowning and stuff like that. And they're like, can I put this in my, and we're like, if you feel led to put that in there as a driver for what made you do what you do, then yes, let's put that in there because that's a part of your story. That's who you are. Um, and it drives you to help the people that you help. And some people have been through other things and they've been like, I don't want that in there. Okay, that's fine. But recognize that's a driver for you. Uh, I think I think it's very important. I just wish that everybody could flip it positive like you did. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I want to, I want to add to that too, Amber, because that just moved me so much. You know, you said the fork in the road at that particular time when you chose that fork in the road, the difference between the two of you was you saw yourself as worthy. And mm -hmm. he did not yeah, I agree. as worthy of taking that path as worthy of investing in yourself and moving ahead. And he did not at that time. Does that mean that he doesn't today? Absolutely not. He may be using his story. And if he's on a podcast with you talking about it, he certainly is using his story to help other people realize what he didn't realize at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think it goes a little deeper than that. I think I have jokingly said to my clients in my law firm, the only thing that's different between you and me is I didn't get caught. Um, and <laughs> it's not 
always a joke, right? right. Of course, um, <laughs> absolutely. You know, there's all of those things that line up and I can look back at my story and see all the choices that I made that had somebody been there at the right time, my life would be completely different. Totally different. Um, but I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on the worth because I don't okay. think that I felt like I was worthy. What I do think is that I felt like that was the fix to my unworthiness. Uh, that, okay. That the law degree and the six figure income would take away the pain rather. So the law degree and the six figure income was my drugs and alcohol. So it was the same behavior. It's just that I um, had a different drug. I you can see that it's still flipping the switch. Yeah. yeah. No, it's I definitely agree with you. The switch like to the yeah. positive, taking those things yeah. that happen to us and saying, I refuse to allow this to drag me down. Yeah, and I think we all could have been, yeah. I know at my, and especially in my late teens, I could have been that guy. Like I, I really could have, yeah. if not for a few adults really shaking some sense into me. Uh, we've all been down roads like that, you know, because everybody's fighting a hard battle, you know, I mean, everybody, really and it, so the message is hey you guys turn this thing to the positive and use it for our for the benefit of others and you'll find so much joy in that uh it's, it's in the brand i'm telling you and you know outside of just the branding conversation into like a human relationship perspective how much more amazing would our life be if instead of judging the person that we saw on the other side, we recognized exactly what you just said. That yeah. if it wasn't for this one or two or three people that I had in my life, that that person that's sitting in that place that is unappealing to me could have been me. And mm -hmm. seeing them as a human being, I think that we, and I know I'm guilty of this many times, it's human behavior where we see the differences before we see the similarities right um and i just think that it's an amazing human conversation to have of like we are so much more alike than we thought we just had different circumstances that gave us different outcomes you know i learned mm -hmm. that through a book and i'm pretty sure please forgive me if i'm wrong i'm pretty sure it was the influencer Mm. Um, they, and they were talking about seeing the value in, in people. I, I will admit openly that I did not see that in every human being uh, up until about 10 years ago. And that was part of my transformation into becoming the abundant life broker and realizing that everybody can turn around tomorrow and start on the right path. And if I can help influence that, I want to do that for the rest of my life. And what made me realize this story was there is a moving company that was founded in in San Francisco, California. Again, forgive me for not knowing their name, uh, but they only hire felons. That's it. They hire that all. That's all they have, and they're the number one moving company in like the state of California, maybe the nation, right? And but they are upfront about who they're hiring. They are, they, but what they teach those men and women that have had these rough pasts is that you can leave that behind, and now you can move forward, and people will trust you again if you ask, act trustworthy. Right. And we have that power to change that. And and they're doing it in, in living it. Right. And living it. And there's only like I can't remember a couple of rules of how you get fired from the job. Of course, stealing would be one of them. Obviously, right. lying would be another one. Right. But they're teaching these moral things, these ethical things, these noadic laws, if you will, that have all been a part of humanity forever and ever and ever, which deal with how you deal with another human being. And their philosophy is nobody's throw like nobody's trash. Nobody's yeah, trash. Absolutely. And they teach that every day. They put the new ones that come in with the more senior people who have been in the program for years and years and years to watch over them so they're not tempted to steal things. And it's like if you can do that with a moving company with trust people trusting you with their whole life's belongings. Literally their it lives. Is yeah, literal exactly. proof that no human being is trash. God's never made any junk. Um, you're making decisions that are not helping you live up to where you're supposed to be. And if you start doing that, then next thing you know, every day, Saturday, that's yeah, what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Good Lord. And, you know, one, one quick thing about different, because I want to put a new, a little spin on the different, because we want to see ourselves as like, 
you know, the things we have in common, because that's beautiful. We're all human and we want to connect on those things, but we need to begin to see each other's differences in a positive light. Yes. Like, yeah. because that's yeah. what's special about you is what, like what's special about you is what makes you different. Nobody, there is no other Amber in the world. Right. There is, there isn't. And, and what makes you different is what we're drawn to. Right. And yeah. so just, you know, I want, I want to leave with that because differentiation is kind of a lot of what we teach, but it's differentiation to see positivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if I'm not careful, this is going to be a seven hour podcast episode. So um, I feel like I could talk to you guys all day long. Before we start to wrap up, I want to um, find out what is this amazing 3D freedom formula to bold and unbeatable brand that you guys have? Because it sounds intriguing. Uh, we'll, we'll do the cliff notes here for you real, real quick. Okay. So it's define, develop and display. And those are really the three simple steps that we take people through behind the scenes. We're turning under the waters with those 77 different criteria that we're looking at when we develop a brand, but on the surface, you're smooth sailing right through it because in the define phase, we look at a couple of different things. Who are your ideal customers? Who do you want to attract into your business and your life? every day. Second, what are those things that set you apart, make you different and attractive to those same people? In other words, how are you going to help them and how does it make their life better? What qualifies you to do that? Those kind of things. So we look at that and then we position someone like Michael, abundant life broker, you success architect, right? Then we start there because that kind of gives some direction. It's kind of like the cover of a book, right? You can't put all the contents of your life on the cover. You can only put what you want people to notice at first to get you to want to open that cup, mm. that first thing. And then I'll, you know, I'll let Michael do the next step. Yeah. The next so. is develop. And so it's not just that we teach people don't fall into the trap of the three amigos. I've got a photo and a tagline and a logo. I've got a brand. You've got three elements of a brand. Uh, now you've got to develop out the rest of it because you can't put everything you do on the cover of that book like she used in that metaphor. So um, once we have that stop you in your tracks with that de definition, now we've got to develop that out. That's your bios. That's your signature sound bites. That's your, mm -hmm. um, your elevator pitch. That's your why. That's when we start building and putting on the muscles and the sinews for the skeleton that we've already started with. But it's not just words. Now, we know that a picture is worth a thousand words. We got to make sure it's the right picture and the right thousand words. They've got, you can't have a picture saying one thing and then your word saying something else. So we got to put that together and position it correctly. Then we've got to have background images that resonate with that. We've got to have that. Your logo is going to be a part of that, of course. Um, all of that's got to be blended in together in the development phase so your ideal customer understands fully why it is that your experience level is important to them so it speaks to them yeah yeah so so once you got all those puzzle pieces or branding elements all ready to go in the development phase then we move into display and really what that means is combine all those together beautiful graphic design, consistency across the board, literally put that brand everywhere because time is not the main success factor for a brand. Yes, brands get stronger over time, more recognizable over time, but literally I can build a beautiful brand right now today. And if I never use it, guess who's not going to have their brand <laughs> built over time? Yes. <laughs> right. A brand is built by impressions and exposures and the more often you get them out there on every platform you can impact, the better it is. So that's the define, develop, display. Yep. So if there's anybody listening to this that is like jumping up and down inside saying, this is what I have needed my entire life, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, all right. Easy. You can find us on any social platform and our handle is at brand face star s t a r at brand face star and then you can go to brandfacestar.com uh you know to our website and learn how to get in touch with any of us we'd love, love to hear it. love it and before we wrap up i will i'm not going to do the full random round because i want to be respectful of your time but there is a question that i ask every single one of my podcast guests and apparently jasmine knows it's time um there is a question I ask every single one of my podcast guests, and that is, what does success mean to you? Can you guys answer that individually for me? How do you define success for yourself? I'll take that first. I define it as freedom. 
because, um, you know, you can, you can, uh, do what makes you a lot of money. You can be a slave to the process into the, into the job and end up not having any time for yourself, or you can do something that's very fulfilling that allows you to truly help people and also gives you time to like be yourself to do the things that you dream of in life besides that, or in addition to that, in conjunction with that, but freedom is what it is for me. Love yeah, it. And Michael? I would go on the same, I, you know, by saying every day, Saturday, I really mean that. And I think that the biggest key for that is I don't compete with anybody. I, I pay attention to my business. I grow my business. Um, and it allows me that freedom to be able to do what I want to do every day and know that I don't really have to answer to anybody but me. Did I give 100% every day of what I wanted to do towards that? And were, my, were the people that I wanted to help? Um, did they get that value? And when that's the case, you, I feel like it's just you don't work. You just show up every day loving what you do. And uh, so I would definitely parrot that. Success is freedom. And I it's love that. tied to it. Look, I've got a seven figure income, you know, Baruch Hashim. I really thank, thank the Lord for that. I worked hard for that, but that it's not about money. It's not about dollars. It's, uh, it, uh, we have just as successful people that have a one person shop and they just want to work with the people they want to work with. That's just as successful. So it's not tied to dollars or commas or zeros. I love that. And it's so true. You know, whatever that, you have to know, and this is why I asked the question, you have to know what success means to you or else you're going to have a marketing and branding company that's building a seven state business for you and freedom for you is being able to go home to your wife and kids at the end of the night or your husband and kids at the end of the night and have dinner. And those two things don't always go together. So um, I love that answer. Tanya, Michael, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. We talked about some really incredible things related to branding and just human nature in general. Um, and you guys dropped so much value. So thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you for having us, Amber. You're awesome. We are honored to be on your show. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. If anything that was said during this episode resonated with you or provided value in any way, it would mean the world to me if you would head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the More Than Corporate Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I'm really looking forward to connecting with you. If you'd also like to connect, I've created a Facebook group that is full of amazing people who also make it their mission to live their best life every single day. If that's that sounds like something that you're interested in. The name of that Facebook group is Success Center. Head over there, request to join, and I look forward to connecting with you soon.